In this video, we're gonna cover Dreamcast emulation in the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. Dreamcast emulation on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch has seen a few updates since my last video. I have also been testing the HLE BIOS, and it's actually pretty awesome to the point that I'm not even gonna use an official Dreamcast BIOS during this new updated guide. There have also been a number of improvements in performance, and a number of games that had slight stutters for me before just don't appear to have that issue. But let's go ahead and dive in. Now before we dive in, this guide is a continuation of my how to install RetroArch video, so please refer back to this guide on how to get RetroArch set up on your Xbox, as well as get a few optional settings configured that we're going to be using throughout this video, most notably in the advanced install section here near the end. But once you have RetroArch up and running, the next thing we're going to need are Dreamcast games. Again, we're not going to actually be using any Dreamcast BIOS or anything like that in this tutorial. We're going to be using the HLE BIOS entirely. It has a 90 plus percent compatibility rate, so it should work for most everything. If you come across a game that doesn't work, that's when you know you need that Dreamcast BIOS. But if you happen to have a large collection of physical Dreamcast games, I do have a guide on how to dump them over on my channel. Link will be in the description below as well as backing up that BIOS file if you do need it for a couple of games. Still useful stuff to have, and does ensure the most compatibility, but for easy setup's sake, we're skipping it today. But let's talk about Dreamcast game format real quick here. I have converted all of my Dreamcast games over to Chud format to make them into single file games, that way I can run them from USB without issue on the Xbox Series X and S. If your games are in a single file format, like CDI or CHUD, they run off of USB no problem. But if you have GDI files with multiple different bin files and things like that involved, those need to be put on the internal SSD. So look at your game format, see what format they're in. If they're multiple files, they need to go on the internal SSD. If they're single files, they can go on USB. So I converted all of my games over to CHUD a couple months back. If you are interested in doing the same thing, I will have a link to a Chudman download that you could grab from my Dropbox. And all you need to do is copy all of the files into your game folder and run the Q or GDI to chud.bat file and it will convert those right over for you. But once you have your games ready to go and you know where you're putting them, all we need to do is move them there. So if you wanted to put them on the internal SSD, if you followed my advanced setup guide, all you need to do is open the development files folder, Windows apps, RetroArch folder, the games folder that you created, and drag them right in. And once those have finished copying over, you're good to move over to the Xbox. Or if you want to put them on USB, just load up your USB drive that you've been using for RetroArch. Or if you're making a new one, just make sure you have a drive formatted as NTFS or XFAT. And drag your Dreamcast games into that. Just another reminder, if you have multi-bin file games, those do need to be placed on the internal SSD. Single file games can go on USB. So CDI, CHUD, USB, fine. GDI, only SSD. And after your games have finished copying over to the USB drive, you can pop that out of your computer, put it back into your Xbox, and get loaded into RetroArch. So now over on your Xbox, we could get booted into RetroArch. And from here, we're free to begin loading up Dreamcast content. So one of the ways to do this, you can go into load content, navigate to your USB drive, Dreamcast games, choose one, and choose the Dreamcast core. Or if you put them on the internal SSD, you'd go to S, Program Files, Windows Apps, RetroArch Folder, Your Made Games Folder, Dreamcast Games, Select a Game, and then the Dreamcast Core and tell it to run. I don't really care for that method, so what I like to do instead is make a games playlist by going to Import Content, then down to Manual Scan. Then go ahead and choose your content directory. So if, so if you're using USB, just choose your E drive, select your Dreamcast Games Folder, and tell it to scan this directory. Or if you're using the S drive, you would navigate to S, Program Files, Windows Apps, RetroArch Folder, Games Folder, Dreamcast Games Folder, and tell it to scan that directory instead. Or if you have games in both directories, you will need to do the scan two times. That's perfectly fine as well. First time choose E, second time choose S. Both work. Under System Name, just press right on your D-pad to go down to Sega and find Sega Dreamcast. Default Core. Press right on your D-pad again to go down to Sega and find Flycast. Right there. And now, if you are using GDI files, you will want to manually set an extension here that says GDI. 
That way you don't pick up all of those separate files that are within GDI files, because if you do, you'll have multiple playlist entries for all those bin files, and it's just a big hassle. So if you have multiple file formats, just type them all in here. So GDI definitely needed. Um, I'm using chud files, so we'll put that in. And then you also want to add in CDI files if you have any of those. That way you can do the scan once, catch all three file types, not get any of the extras that GDI keeps with it. So very useful. Make sure scan recursively is set to on if you have your game separated into subfolders. And don't have these games compressed. All right, but once you're all set, go ahead and start the scan. And once it's finished, you'll have a new Dreamcast playlist entry here on the left with all of your games inside of it that matched those file types. But then to play a game, all you need to do is select it and tell it to run. And when you first load up a game in the HLE BIOS, you might notice that it's in Japanese. That's perfectly normal. All you need to do to get that fixed over to English or whatever other language you need to, just go into your RetroArt Quick menu, go to Options, and then scroll down until you find the Language option here, and it's set to default. So I'm just going to change this over to English. Now all I need to do is close my content, which will crash RetroArch, that's fine. Just load back in. And then we can go back down to the Dreamcast and reload the game. But there we go, now we're in English. Hooray! But there we are, Dreamcast games up and running on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. And as I mentioned before, there are a number of performance improvements over the previous guide since uh, it's been about seven months since I made that one. Might still notice a few frame hiccups here and there, but overall way better than it used to be, and it's really enjoyable. And you get the full access of Dreamcast games with the HLE BIOS, including Windows CE titles, so games like Resident Evil 2 even work with the HLE BIOS, and it's great. Again, if you do encounter a game that has a compatibility issue, you may need to put that BIOS file in there, and it just goes in the DC folder and all that. Now, there is one thing I would like to note about running Flycast with no Dreamcast BIOS installed, and that comes with multi-disc games. Now, normally, you could do a multi-disc game, and it says, hey, this game can only be started from disc one, so you could normally just go in, do your quick menu, go down to disc control, eject the disc, load up a new disc, select disc one, and then insert the disc. But with no... Dreamcast BIOS in place, it doesn't take you back to the main menu for you to start up the new disk, so you just have to close the content down, manually load up the new disk, and then start it back up. A little less streamlined, but shouldn't negatively impact the experience in any way, but just wanted you all to be aware of that. So for those of you looking to get Dreamcast games up and running on your Xbox Series X or S, that is the basic method of how to do so. A lot more straightforward without the need of the BIOS files, but there are a few things to note about such a configuration. But now let's go ahead and talk about some of the more advanced core options available to us within Flycast. So to do this, open up your RetroArch Quick Menu. And from here, scroll down to Options. Now our first option is to boot into the BIOS. This isn't going to work. We don't have a BIOS installed, so don't worry about that. Next up, System Type. This is set to Auto by default, and it will let you choose between a Dreamcast, Naomi, and a Thomas Wave system. Auto should work great for most use cases, but you can manually set it here if needed. Next up, HLE BIOS. If you do have a BIOS file in your system folder, you could choose to use it or not with this option. If you turn this option on, it would use the HLE BIOS. If it's off, it will use the BIOS within your system folder. Now, next up, we have Internal Resolution, and this lets you change the internal resolution your Dreamcast games are running at. You can choose all the way up to a full 4K if you want to, or higher. I've tested a number of games at 4K, and they all seem to be working pretty well these days, but if you get some lag introduced by the upscale, you could just lower it back down. Now, one thing I would like to point out about higher resolutions, it doesn't stick to the proper 4x3 aspect ratio once you get higher than 1080p, I believe. And modifying the internal resolution does require a content restart, so once you select a resolution that you like, you just gotta back out of this menu and uh, close the content, which will crash RetroArch. 
Then you can just go back in. And reload into the game you were playing. And now my games are running at that 1080p internal resolution. And like I said, most of the stuff I've tested works great up to 4K, but just losing the proper 4x3 aspect ratio isn't something I prefer. If you don't mind the stretch presentation, go for it. Next up, screen orientation. You can set this to vertical or horizontal. If you have a tape mode shooter game, you can change the orientation here. Next up, alpha sorting. Leave this on per triangle. It is more accurate. If you have a game that's kind of lagging, you could try changing it to per strip. It will mess up some of the graphics, but you should get a little bit of a speed increase. Next up, GD-ROM fast loading. So this will increase the speed of loading on the games. It is inaccurate and can break a few things, but you can experiment with it on your games and see what you think. Next up, MIP mapping and fog effects. Leave those on. If you turn them off, you will lose out on graphical features. And same with volume modifier. And next up, we have a widescreen hack. So this will try to render your game in widescreen. You may notice object culling around the 4x3 edges without the use of a widescreen type code. But this option does require a content restart, so if you want to try it out, you will need to restart the content to see the effects. And then next up, widescreen cheats. This will let you better implement widescreen in my opinion, but I don't know. I prefer my old games to be my old games personally, so I'm not really going to cover it more than that. Next up, cable type. The Dreamcast had numerous input options, so you could choose that here. Next we have broadcast types and region codes. So set those as you need. Next, language. We already set this earlier because all of our stuff was in Japanese. DIV matching. Leave this on auto. Next up, we have Force Windows CE mode, and this is useful for certain types of homebrew or unreleased games that needed Windows CE stuff that just don't seem to be implemented automatically. So for most retail releases, you shouldn't need this, but if you're trying to do like Half-Life, the unreleased version of Half-Life or something, you might want to turn this option on. It can make it so it works. Next up, Analog Stick Dead Zones. You can set these as you see fit, 30% or 0% or anywhere in between. Trigger dead zones, these are set to 0% by default, and I think that works out pretty well. If you want, you can enable digital triggers, that way they activate quicker. Could be useful for fighting games. Next up, enable DSP. This is your audio emulation. If you turn this off, you will have no sound, so leave it on. Next, anisotropic filtering. This is set to 4 by default. Increase this up to 16 times if you wish. I haven't noticed any bugs by using it on the Flycast Core, but if you notice something that didn't used to be there, you could turn it back down to 4 and just leave it as it is. Next up, the Power VR 2 post-processing filter. Unfortunately, this does not work on the Xbox version of RetroArch. When you turn it on, you are just met with a black screen, so just leave it off. Next, texture upscaling using the XBRZ method. Can up-res your textures up to 6 times. And then if you decide to upscale the textures, you can also change the filtered size from 256 up to 1024 or to 512. Mess around with them, see what you think. I haven't noticed much of a performance hit on my games using any of these options. Next, we have enable render to texture buffer and render to texture upscaling. And then you can set an upscaling mode for that as well. Next up, threaded rendering, leave this on. Otherwise you're gonna take a performance hit. And synchronous rendering, leave that one on as well. Next up, delay frame swapping. So if you are playing a game and it starts having some like flashing glitchy videos, you could try enabling this. It might have a performance hit. I haven't noticed any with it on, but shouldn't need it in most things. Frame skipping, gonna skip that because no. Next up, Puro Puro pack. So this is your rumble pack. Leave that on if you want rumble. Turn it off if you don't want rumble. Next up, we have load custom textures and dump textures. I'm not gonna be covering those in this video. And next up, per game VMUs. I like turning this option on just so that way I have a dedicated memory card for every single one of my Dreamcast games. I don't have to worry about running out of space. If you decide to use this option, set it before you play anything because you will need to restart your game and start up a new save file when you set this option. Now, next up, show VMU display settings. Turn this on and you're able to mess around with some VMU settings. One of the greatest things about Dreamcast is it had that VMU, you could have uh, extra info on it. So in emulation, you could actually turn these displays on. So now in the top left corner of my screen, it has a VMU display option. And you can mess around with the size of that, the position. So if you wanna make it a little bit bigger or a lot bigger, really, just note it is gonna take up some of your video screen of the gameplay. So I like to set mine to around two or three X, depending on the game.
And then you could choose the colors that it displays in. I like to leave it on the VMU green, but you can mess around with this and make it some really interesting displays. Then you can also change the opacity so you can see the game underneath it still, so it's not as intrusive. And then you have that option for VMUs 2 through 4 as well. But not bad. It's pretty cool. And then once you're done setting up your VMU settings, you could disable this option again. That way it's uh, not making a big old mess in your quick menu options. And last up, we have show light gun settings, but light guns aren't something that work in the Xbox version of RetroArch currently, so we're just going to skip over this for now. But that's going to do it as far as core options within the Flycast core is concerned. If you have options you want to set for some games but not others, you can save them as a game option file here, so that way every time you load up that specific game, those are the options that will greet it. But that's going to do it for this one, so as always, thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me down in the comments section below, and I will do my best to try to help you out. But now if you could all do me a huge favor, and please be sure to hit that like or dislike button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to hit that sub button so you can see when new videos like this go live goes a long way to helping us keep the growth of the place going and hitting our goals and we're just super thankful to all of you for that if you'd like to further help support the channel you could also check out that join button here on youtube or check out the patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen a little goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and just another huge shout out to all of our current champions you guys are just such amazing rock stars thank you so much for believing in what we do you're amazing but that's gonna do it for this one, so until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, stay awesome, and we will see you all back next video.